In this presentation, we are going to look at the New Testament books of First and Second Peter and the doctrines that they teach. So let's begin with First Peter. So by way of introduction, a theme found throughout the first epistle of Peter is that through the atonement, disciples of Jesus Christ can faithfully endure suffering and persecution. Even chap every chapter of First Peter speaks of trials or sufferings, and Peter taught that patiently enduring trials was more precious than gold and would help believers gain perfection and salvation to your souls. Peter reminded the saints of their identity and destiny as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. Modern readers will find hope, encouragement, and strength in Peter's timeless counsel. As the chief apostle who held the priesthood of the keys of the kingdom, Peter held a position similar to that of the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in our day. Near the conclusion of this letter, Peter mentioned that Silvanus had served as scribe. Silvanus, also known as Silas, had previously served as both a scribe and a missionary companion to Paul. Peter addressed this epistle to church members scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and five Roman provinces in Asia Minor, located in modern-day Turkey. Peter considered his readers to be the elect of God. Peter wrote to strengthen and encourage the saints in the trials of their faith and to prepare them for the future fiery trials. Peter's message also taught them how to, dis to decrease persecution through their righteous actions. Peter's counsel was very timely because church members were about to enter a period of heightened persecution. Until AD 64, about the time when Peter wrote this epistle, the Roman government displayed a general tolerance for Christianity. In July of that year, a fire destroyed much of Rome. It was rumored that Nero, Emperor, the Emperor Nero himself ordered the fire to be started. In an effort to divert blame for the disaster, Nero accused the Christians of starting the fire. This led to the intense persecution of Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Some of the mistreatment experienced by Christians came from their former friends and neighbors. Peter indicated that when the saints suffer as Christians, they can feel joy knowing that they are following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Peter knew that the saints could strengthen each other as they faced increased persecution. To help alleviate their suffering, Peter exhorted his readers to turn to one another in love and tenderness. Furthermore, 1 Peter 5, Peter specifically explained how congregations and chief church leaders could strengthen one another. Peter's words contain perhaps the clearest biblical references to the spirit world and what takes place there. Peter briefly mentioned that Jesus Christ visited the spirit world to preach to the disobedient spirits who had lived in Noah's day. He added that the gospel was preached to the dead to allow decreased, deceased individuals a chance to be judged equitably. That's Peter 4, 5-6. Peter's writings demonstrate his growth from a simple fisherman to a mighty apostle. In our dispensation, Joseph F. Smith was pondering the meaning of 1 Peter 3, 18-30 and 1 Peter 4, 6 when he received a revelation clarifying doctrines regarding the spirit world, which is now Doctrine and Covenants section 138. Joseph Smith said, having reference to both the doctrine taught and the language used, quote, Peter penned the most sublime language of any of the apostles, end of quote. Now let's turn to 1 Peter 1, the trial of our faith precedes salvation. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Peter greeted his readers by calling them the elect according to the foreknowledge of God, 1 Peter 1, 2. 
Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that being elect in the premortal world is not enough to receive God's blessings, for we must also be elect in mortality. Quote, in the full blessings of salvation are to follow, the doctrine of election must operate twice. First, righteous spirits are elected or chosen to come to mortality as heirs of special blessings. Then, they must be called and elected again in this life, an occurrence which takes place when they join the true church. See Doctrine and Covenants 53.1. Finally, in order to reap eternal salvation, they must press forward in obedient devotion to the truth until they make their colony election sure. Second Peter 1. That is, are sealed up into eternal life. Doctrine and Covenants 131 verse 5. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 2, sanctification. Sanctification means holiness, which means being separated or set apart for a specific purpose. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, quote, To be sanctified is to become clean, pure, and spotless, to be free from the blood and sins of the world, to become a new creature of the Holy Ghost, one whose body has been renewed by the rebirth of the Spirit. Sanctification is a state of saintliness, a state attained only by conformity to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The plan of salvation is the system and the means whereby provided whereby men may sanctify their souls and thereby become worthy of a celestial inheritance. End of quote. Thus, when we become sanctified, we are separated from the world and set apart for the specific purpose of gaining exaltation and becoming joint heirs with Christ. Chapter 1, verse 2, the phrase sprinkling of the blood, meaning the blood of Christ, so described because of the similitude set forth in the Passover of the children of Israel by the angel of death. Even as the firstborn in Israelitish homes were saved because the blood of the lamb was sprinkled on the lintel and side posts of the door. That's in Exodus 12. So all men may be saved by the blood of that lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 4. Lively hope of a resurrection of Christ or by the resurrection of Christ. Peter wrote that the lively hope that comes from Jesus Christ's resurrection is one of the choice blessings experienced by faithful followers of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1.3. If Christ was resurrected, so it, so it is or shall be with all men. If the resurrection of one man is established, then the resurrection of all men is possible. And if the one known to have faith come from the tomb is also the Son of God, a fact which is itself proved by the resurrection, then his testimony is true that all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. John 5:28-29. Indeed, the fact of our Lord's resurrection and a consequent immortality thereby passed on to them, all men lies at the heart and core of the center of Christianity. Unless Christ was resurrected, he was not the Son of God. Unless he inherited from an immortal father the power of immortality, he was as other, man, inca other men incapable of bursting the bands of death for himself and for all men. The resurrection proves the divine sonship, and the divine sonship is established by the fact of resurrection. The two are inseparably connected. Both are true, or neither is. And if Christ is God's Son, then the gospel of God concerning Jesus Christ Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 1, 1 through 3, is true. His provisions are in force and salvation is available to men. But if Christ is not God's son, there is no atonement, no ransom from temporal and spiritual death, no resurrection, no forgiveness of sin, no eternal life, and as Paul says, our faith is vain. Boy, that would be a miserable way to live in mortality that you have no hope of anything after this life. 
Moreover, true religion is not something for this life alone. It does not suffice for men to gain to attain peace here while they are let while they let eternity take care of itself. Such a limitation would leave the saints as the most miserable of all men. Rather, their hope in Christ is for a better world to come. This life is the time to prepare to meet God, to inherit the eternal life made possible through our Lord's atoning sacrifice is the hope and goal of all those whose hearts are set on righteousness. 1 Peter 1, the phrase kept through faith. Those foreordained to be saved shall be saved if they keep the commandments. 1 Peter 1, 5, the phrase salvation. With three or four possible exceptions, all of the revelations of all the ages speak of salvation as being wholly, completely, and totally synonymous with eternal or everlasting life with exaltation in the highest heaven of the celestial world, with attaining godhood and becoming like God the Eternal Father. The exceptions are given to enable us to gain a complete perspective of the substance and thought content. These exceptions equate salvation with resurrection or immortality only, rather than with immortality coupled with eternal glory. You can see that in 2 Nephi 9, 26, DNC 76, 40 through 44, and Doctrine and Covenants 132, 17. We may, of course, for purposes of clear understanding, create definitions of salvation of our own as telestial or terrestrial, terrestrial salvation, meaning an inheritance in one or the other of those kingdoms. But the gospel is a gospel of eternal life of exaltation, of glory, and honor. And so the Lord chooses to have his prophets equate salvation with the type and kind of life he lives, rather than with the ultimate inheritance of some lesser being, or of some wicked or rebellious person who rejected the gospel, suffered in hell until the second resurrection, and then came forth to that telestial inheritance whose inhabitants cannot go where God and Christ are, worlds without end. See DNC 76, 109 through 112. Amulek, for instance, says that no one's clean thing can enter, can inherit the kingdom of heaven, and then ask, how can ye be saved except ye inherit the kingdom of heaven? Alma eleven thirty seven. Salvation is defined and explained by Joseph Smith in the Lectures on Faith in these words, quote, We shall find, where shall we find a prototype into whose likeness we may be assimilated, in order that we may be made partakers of life and salvation? Or in other words, where shall we find a saved being? For if we can find a saved being, we may ascertain without much difficulty what all others must be in order to be saved. We think that it will not be a matter of dispute that two beings who are unlike each other cannot be saved. For whatever constitutes the salvation of one will constitute the salvation of every creature which will be saved. And if we find one saved being in all existence, we may see that others must be or else not be saved. When asked, then, where is the prototype or where is the saved being, we conclude as to the answer of this question, there will be no dispute among those who believe in the Bible that it is Christ. All will agree in this that he is the prototype or standard of salvation or in other words, that he is a saved being. And if we should continue our interrogation and ask how is it that he is saved, the answer would be because he is just and holy being. And if he were anything different from what he is, he would not be saved. For his salvation depends on his being precisely what he is and nothing else for if it were not possible for if it were possible for him to change in the least degree so sure he would find he would fail of salvation and lose all his dominion power authority glory which constitute salvation 
For salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion which Jehovah possesses, and in nothing else. And no being can possess it but himself or one like him. Then, after quoting several biblical passages, the account continues, Joseph Smith's quotation, These sayings of the Savior most clearly show unto us the nature of salvation and what he proposed unto the human family when he proposed to save them, that he proposed to make them like unto himself. And he was like the Father, the great prototype of all saved beings. And for any portion of the human family to be assimilated into their likeness is to be saved, and to be unlike them is to be destroyed. And on this hinge turns the door of salvation. End of quote. That's Lectures of Faith, page 63 through 67. First Peter 1, verses 6 through 8, the phrase, the trial of your faith. Peter knew that church members were facing ridicule for their beliefs. However, he wrote that trials of faith are more precious than gold, 1 Peter 1, 7. Like gold, our faith in Jesus Christ is refined when we faithfully endure fiery trials. Jesus is our exemplar in all things. His crown of thorns came first and then his crown of glory. Why would we expect us to be any different then, brothers and sisters? We cannot have crowns of glory without our own crowns of thorns. There is an eternal principle associated with suffering. After affliction and tribulation, which brings sorrow and the need to be long-suffering, come joy, blessings, and exaltation. Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, The Apostle Peter is identified something he called a trial of your faith. He had experienced it. Remember Jesus' words, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail thee not. Peter later encouraged others, Think it not strange, he said, concerning the fiery trials which is, in, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you, First Peter 4.12. These fiery trials are designed to make you stronger, but they have the potential to diminish or even destroy your trust in the Son of God and to weaken your resolve to keep your promises to Him. How do you remain steadfast and immovable, Alma 125, during a trial of faith? You must immerse yourself in the very things that help build the core of faith. You exercise faith in Christ, you pray, you ponder the scriptures, you repent, you keep the commandments, and you serve others. When faced with a trial of faith, whether you do, you don't step away from the church. Distancing yourself from the kingdom of God during a trial of faith, faith is like leaving the safety of a secure storm cellar just as the tornado comes into view. End of quote. Mormon taught concerning the trial of our faith, quote, And now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not because you see not, for ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. Ether 12.6 The word trial cannot only refer to afflictions or sufferings, but in a courtroom setting, the word trial refers to producing evidence to reach a conviction or determine innocence. Thus, the trial of your faith may also refer to what evidence are you producing by your obedience to the gospel, keeping of covenants, submitting your will to the Father, etc., if we are not living the gospel of Jesus Christ to become like him, then why should the Holy Ghost give you a witness of the truth? So a trial of faith may mean that God is watching to see what our actions, what evidence they produce that we have faith in him. That's another way you could interpret a trial 
of your faith. Is your life producing evidence that you have faith in Christ, even through going through suffering? 1 Peter 1, 8 through 10, the end of your faith. Peter told the saints, quote, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9. The end in this passage can also be translated as outcome or goal. See 1 Peter 1, 9, footnote A. Therefore, Peter's point was that saints who endure adversity can receive their ultimate goal of salvation through Jesus Christ. For some Christians in Peter's day, enduring in faith did not mean enduring more, more, enduring mortal difficulty such as illness. For them, enduring in faith resulted in their deaths. Peter's testimony was intended to strengthen all the saints of his time, including those whose faith would cost them their lives. A good question to ask ourselves sometimes, brother or sister, is not, do I have faith in Christ? For certain blessings and to live, but do I have enough faith in Christ to die? It takes faith to die and to die faithfully in Christ. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. All the ancient prophets sought salvation and prophesied of the coming of Christ and his sufferings and atoning sacrifice. They knew beforehand by the power of the Holy Ghost what Christ had in store for the Meridian saints. And so glorious is the message of redemption that even the angels desire to learn of it. 1 Peter 1.11, the phrase, the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, a personage of spirit, is a revelator. Revelation comes by his power. He is broadcasting all truth out into the immensity all the time. Isn't that an interesting thought? The Holy Ghost is constantly transmitting truth throughout the immensity of space. It's just whether we're going to tune in. And the Spirit of Christ, the light of Christ, is the light that proceeds forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space is the means and agency used for carrying the revealed word to men, for disseminating eternal truths to mortal hearts. See James 1, 17 through 21. Chapter 1, verse 11, the phrase, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. There seems to be an eternal principle associated with suffering. The following scriptures illustrate this principle. Alma 7, 5, my joy come... My joy cometh over them after waiting through much affliction and sorrow. Alma 7.11 Ye shall be patient in long suffering and affliction, that you, may show, that you may show forth good examples unto them in me, and I will make an instrument of thee in my hands unto the salvation of many souls. Alma 26.27 Bear with patience thine afflictions, and I will give unto you success. Alma 28, 8. This is the account of their suffering in the land, their sorrows and their afflictions, and their incomprehensible joy. Doctrine and Covenants 58, 4. After much tribulation cometh the blessings. Doctrine and Covenants 121, 7 through 8. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment, and if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. We were meant to come to her mortality and suffer so that we may learn the sweet. And you can only know that if you have the bitter. In other words, after affliction, sorrow, long-suffering, tribulation, and adversity comes joy, success, blessings, and exaltation. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. You cannot experience joy and success and blessings without knowing their opposites. 1 Peter 1, 13-16, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Peter reminded the saints that they had been called by Jesus Christ to be holy as he is holy. Christ is the prototype of salvation, the great exemplar, the only one who can say with perfect propriety, and without any reservation or limitation on the language used, be holy, for I am holy. What manner of men ought you to be? 
Verily I say unto you, even as I am. 3 Nephi 27, 27. President Russell M. Nelson spoke of our potential to become holy like Jesus Christ. Quote, the scriptures hold the promise that we shall, if faithful in all things, become like deity. Encouragement comes as we follow the example of Jesus who taught, Be ye holy, for I am holy. His hope for us is crystal clear. He declared, What manner of men ought you to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. Thus, our adoration of Jesus is best expressed by our emulation of Jesus. This divine entreaty is consistent with the fact that, as begotten children of heavenly parents, we are endowed with the potential to become like them, just as mortal children may become like their mortal parents. End of quote. 1 Peter 1, 13, Gird up thy, the loins of your mind. An interesting idiom, gird up the loins of your mind, or as we might say in English idiom, roll up your sleeves, that is, prepare yourselves. 1 Peter 1, 5, So be ye holy. Holy is used to translate the Greek hagios, meaning saintly. Conversation is the King James rendering of the Greek word meaning conduct, or in other words, act like saints in all your conduct. In Hebrew, the word for holy is kados, meaning to be set apart or separated for a specific purpose. Thus, we were foreordained, set apart, separated, to become like God and gain eternal life. Now in mortality, we are seeking to bring that to pass by having faith in Christ and his gospel. 1 Peter 1, 17-20, Jesus Christ was foreordained to redeem us. Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. The word redeem, the word redeem means to purchase back, to ransom, or to rescue from captivity. Peter taught his Gentile Christian readers that their spiritual ransom had been paid, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1.19 He also taught that Christ's role as our Redeemer was foreordained before the earth was created. Christ was chosen and prepared in pre-mortality, and his future atonement operated retroactively on behalf of before we came to this earth. See Doctrine and Covenants 93.38. When the Father presented the plan of salvation and pre-mortal life, when he announced the need for one of his spirit sons to be born into mortality as the literal Son of God, thus inheriting from the Father the power to work out the infinite and eternal atonement, Christ answered by saying in substance and thought, Here am I, send me. I will be thy son. I will follow thy plan. Men shall have their agency, and those who believe and obey shall be saved. And Father, the honor and glory be thine forever. Joseph Smith taught, quote, At the first organization in heaven, we were all present and saw the Savior chosen and appointed and the plan of salvation made, and we sanctioned it. End of quote. So this was not something new to us. This is not something that we were not told about, and it was surprised upon us. We were all present when this plan was adopted by Jesus Christ. And as it said, we all sanctioned it, except for those third who decide to follow Lucifer. President Russell M. Nelson taught, Quote, Before the foundation of the earth, the plan of salvation was prepared. It included the glorious possibility of divine inheritance in the kingdom of God. Central to that plan was the atonement of Jesus Christ in premortal councils. He was foreordained by his Father to atone for our sins and break the bands of physical and spiritual death. Jesus declared, I was prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. In me shall all mankind have life, and that eternally, even they who believe on my name. 
Ether 314, end of President Nelson's quote. Chapter 1, verse 17, when he judges whose judgment is just, it shall be done without respect of persons. Every person will receive exactly what he merits, neither adding nor diminishing from. See James 2, 1 through 9. 1 Peter 1, 21, by him believed in God, meaning it is only in and through Christ that men can believe in the Father. God is in Christ, manifesting himself to the world. No man cometh unto the Father, John 14, 6 says, except through Christ, and belief in the Father begins with belief in the Son, John 12, 44. The phrase that your faith and hope in God means Christ is the door to the Father. The first principle of the gospel is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is centered in him and through him and in the Father. Faith in the Father grows out of faith in the Son. He that will not believe in me will not believe the Father who sent me. That's Ether 12, for, that is Ether 4.12. 1 Peter 1.22, phrase purified through the Spirit. Remission of sins comes by the power of the Holy Ghost. The receipt of the Holy Ghost is the baptism of fire, which baptism burns sin and iniquity out of the human soul, as though by fire. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, meaning the fruit of earthly harvest is born from seed that dies in the birth process. But the seed which brings spiritual rebirth to the saints is the word of truth found in the gospel, and it liveth and abideth forever. And the Lord said unto me, Marvel not that all mankind, yea, men and women, all nations, kindred, tongues, and people, must be born again, yea, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen state, to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons and daughters, and thus they become new creatures. And unless they do this, they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Mosiah 27, 25 through 26. Now I say unto you that you must repent and be born again. For the Spirit saith, if you are not born again, you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore come and be baptized unto repentance, that ye may be washed from your sins, that you may have faith on the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world, who is mighty to save and to cleanse all from all unrighteousness. Alma 7.14 1 Peter 1, 24-25, the phrase, all flesh is as grass. The phrase, all flesh is as grass, comes from Isaiah 40, verses 6-8, which compares man's frailties to the withering of vegetation in the hot desert wind. Unlike the withering grass, the word of the Lord abideth forever. It gives life and strength to all who embrace it and are born again. The phrase, the glory of man, what is it? Nothing more than the grass that withereth and the flowers that fadeth away. Kings and emperors rule today and are dust tomorrow. And what of their eternal souls? What shall their eternal glory be unless they have also the gospel, out of which salvation comes and which alone endures forever? Grass is a symbol of the transitoriness of man. With the heavy rains of winter grass can flourish and even spread over the barren wilderness, but it is gone with the wisp of the transi transitor transitional. The blades are vivacious and vigorous one day and vanish the next. So is the life of man, but some things, like the word of God, are timeless and permanent. Given the transitory nature of temporal life on earth, it is comforting to know that there is also the preeminence of an unchanging and never-ending providence. If God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Matthew six thirty. Let's now go to 1 Peter chapter 2, Converts are Newborn Babes in Christ. 
1 Peter 2, 1 through 8, living stone, chief cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling. The term laying aside in 1 Peter 21 means that believers should lay aside past sins. Peter taught when the saints come into Jesus Christ, who is the living stone, they become a lively stone that is added to the building of God's spiritual house. Peter also called Christ the chief cornerstone, emphasizing that the house is built upon the resurrected Jesus Christ. In contrast to Christ's role as the chief cornerstone, Peter also called Jesus Christ a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, emphasizing that the Savior would be a barren, a, I'm, I apologize, would be a barrier in the path of those who wish to be disobedient. The clear meaning is Christ our Lord, the promised Messiah, the stone of Israel, as a precious and tried person, shall come to Israel and be the foundation upon which they shall build the house of salvation. He shall be the cornerstone of the house and the kingdom of God itself. And all they who believe in him and build on the foundation he lays shall be saved. When the stone of Israel comes, he shall be a sanctuary for the righteous, and they shall find peace and safety under the shelter of his gospel. But he shall be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, also a gin and a snare, meaning traps, to the rebellious and disobedient in Jerusalem and in all Israel. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Malice, evil speaking. Ill will or enmity of heart towards others, feelings of dislike which are deep seated and unreasonable and which take pleasure in seeing others suffered. That's what malice and evil speaking means. Guile meaning deceitful, cunning, craft, and treachery. Guile is of the devil and damns the soul. Those in whose mouth no guile is found are without fault before the throne of God. Revelation 14, 5, and they shall have eternal life. Many of the faithful members of the church are without guile. Hypocrisies, meaning where members of the church are concerned, hypocrisy is to profess religion and not practice it. If a teacher advocates the payment of tithing, but does not himself pay an honest tithe, he is a hypocrite. If a person prays and seeks temporal and spiritual blessings from the Lord and then turns away the naked and needy and fails to visit the sick and afflicted, he is a hypocrite. He has professed from the Lord and then turns away the naked and the needy and fails to visit. I'm sorry, I repeated that. He has professed religion but not practiced it. Envyings mean begrudging me discontent at the excellence and good fortune of others. Preach against all lyings and deceivings and envies and strifes and malice and revilings and stealings, robblings, plundering, murdering, committing adultery, and all manner of lasciviousness, crying that these things ought not to be. Alma 16, 18. Evil speaking mean false, corrupt, wicked, degrading, profane, or belittle, belittle, belittling words spoken about persons or things. 1 Peter 2, 9-10, through 10, a peculiar people. Peter called the saints a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation a peculiar people. Peter's message was that by... Peter's message was that by embracing the gospel, Gentile converts had become a part of God's chosen people, the new Israel. They were the chosen nation, a royal kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Concerning the term peculiar people, President Russell M. Nelson taught, quote, In the Old Testament, the Hebrew term for the pe which peculiar was translated is segulah, which means value, property, or treasure. In the New Testament, the Greek term for which peculiar was translated is pre eposius if I'm saying that right, which means possession or an, obtain or an obtaining. Thus we see that the scriptural term peculiar signifies valued treasure made or selected by God. 
For us to be identified by servants of the Lord as his peculiar people is a compliment of the highest order. End of quote. One of the tests of mortality will be whatever we one of the tests of mortality will be whether we can let the Savior be our owner, his value property. This requires complete submission of our will to the will of the Father. Brothers and sisters, can we let the Savior own us and, in a sense, be slaves to his righteousness? Chapter 2, verse 9, a royal priesthood. Whenever the Lord had a people on earth, he offered to make them a nation of kings and priests, not a congregation of lay members with a priest or a minister at the head, but a whole church in which every man is his own minister, and in which every man stands as a king in his own right, reigning over his own family kingdom. The priesthood which makes a man a king and a priest is thus a royal priesthood. To ancient Israel, the offer was made in these words, If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Exodus 19.5-6 Peter is here telling the Meridian saints that they have the same promise and John records that some of them did in fact obtain this royal status and became kings and priests who should in due course live and reign with Christ on earth. And the same blessings are available to the Latter-day Saints through the ordinances of the house of the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 9, the phrase has marvelous light, meaning the light of Christ, the light of truth, the light of the gospel. That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continue in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Doctrine and Covenants 50, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, 10, the phrase, the people of God. Those who join the church thereby become the Lord's people. They are adopted into his family. They are set apart from the world. They become a part of the nation and kingdom of Israel. The phrase obtain mercy meaning justice is for the ungodly. Mercy for the penitent. Mercy comes only to those who repent and live the gospel. All others are subject to the law of justice and pay the penalty for their own sins. See Alma 42, 22-26. Know, therefore, that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 7, 9. 1 Peter 2.11, the phrase, abstain from fleshly lusts. As part of the Father's plan to enable spirit children to advance and progress and become like him, two probationary states are provided, the pre-existent first estate and the second estate of mortality. In pre-existence, we were tested as spirit beings and under circumstances which we walked by sight, knowing who our Father was and having a perfect knowledge that he was the source and author of the laws we were counseled to obey. As a result of long association there, the Lord knows exactly how we respond to his will as spirits and when we have a knowledge of him and his laws. The Father knows us in and out intimately and exactly. Hence, he provided this mortal estate to try and test us under different circumstances, under circumstances in which we would be subject to the lusts of the flesh, and when we would walk not by sight but by faith. And thus there is an imperative need for fleshly lusts as part of the eternal plan. This very sphere of existence is, del is deliberately designed as one in which all men will be subject to the appetites and passions and lusts of life. The whole issue is whether we as mortals walk in the Spirit, whether we walk by faith, as though seeing Him who is invisible. 
The issue is whether we take Peter's counsel and abstain from these fleshly lusts, or whether we follow the world's course of appetites and indulgence. 1 Peter 2.12 set an example of proper conduct to non-members. And though they now think evil of you, perhaps they, seeing your good works, will repent and gain the blessings of the gospel. The phrase, they speak evil against you as evildoers, meaning it is standard operating procedure for the unrepentant and sin-laden enemies of the truth to accuse the saints of evil doing. The phrase, the day of visitation, meaning the day of judgment, the second coming, the day when the Lord comes again to take vengeance upon the wicked and ungodly. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 14, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, While man dwells in his spirit sphere and as an in essential part of working out his salvation, he must obey the laws of the land in which he lives. The perfect system of government is a theocracy in which God governs in both civil and ecclesiastical fears. Such was the case among the saints from Adam to Noah. But with the rise of other governments and the birth of religious climates in which church members were a minority portion of the population of the earth, sharp divisions between the operation of church and state came into being. Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses were all subject to the Pharaoh while in Egypt. The children of Israel were subject to a partial theoretic, theocratic governmental arrangement during much of their history. But in Peter's day and in ours, the saints are subject to two wholly separate and individual systems of direction. The church, which directs in ecclesiastical matters, and the state which governs in civil affairs. An experience gained through conformity to both systems of government is essential to the perfecting of the human soul. Hence, Peter's categorical statement that it is the will of the Lord for his saints to submit to civil governments, for the Lord truly renders unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. On August 1st, 1831, with reference to the then-existent laws in the United States, the Lord revealed this same principle to Joseph Smith in these words, Let no man break the laws of the land, for he that keepeth the laws of God hath no need to break the laws of the land. Wherefore, be subject to the powers that be, until he reigns whose right it is to reign, and subdues all enemies under his feet. Doctrine and Covenants 58, 21-22. Similarly, the Lord justifies those saints who live under the American constitutional system in befriending the law which is the constitutional law of the land, D&C 98, 6. And, it is, and in its declaration of belief regarding governments and laws in general, the Church affirms, we believe that all men are bound to sustain and uphold the respective governments in which they reside, while protection in their inherent and inalienable rights by the laws of such governments, and that sedition and rebellion are unbecoming of every citizen thus protected, and should be punished accordingly, and that all governments have a right to enact such laws as in their own judgments are best calculated to secure the public interest at the same time, however holding sacred the freedom of conscience. Doctrine and Covenants 134, verse 5. It is true that instances may arise when rulers of men may issue decrees that are counter to the mind and will of the Lord, as when Peter and John, having healed the lame man from his mother's womb, and having caused some 5,000 men to believe in Christ and his resurrection, to the great consternation of the Jewish priests and Sadducees, were condemned not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus Christ. That's in Acts 3 and chapter 4, verse 1 through 22. In such cases, when God, when God so reveals and commands, his people are expected to reject the civil law and follow the counsel announced from on high. 
Otherwise, his saints are expected to conform to the civil law, and they are never justified in opposing it unless a such course is marked out for them by revelation. So only God can command and direct that. And that would most likely come through the channels of his president that he has on the earth. 1 Peter 2, 15-17 with well-doing as free, this phrase meaning, through righteous conduct we may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men and their misguided ideologies. It is the will of the Lord that all men should be free, and governments are or should be designed to aid them in preserving their freedoms. Speaking to the saints in America in the early days of this dispensation, he said, I, the Lord God, make you free, therefore you are free indeed, and the law... The constitutional law of the land maketh you free. The principle of freedom on which this law is based, he said, belongs to all mankind. Doctrine and Covenants 98, verses 5 through 7. And further, laws based on the principles of freedom should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh, according to just and holy principles, that every man may act in doctrine and principles pertaining to futurity, according to the moral agency which I give unto him, that every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. Doctrine and Covenants 101, 77 through 78. The phrase not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, meaning through ungodly men may turn freedom into license. The servants of God are to exercise their liberty according to gospel standards. 1 Peter 2, 18-25, and in chapter 3, 14, Jesus Christ was an example of how to endure suffering. In 1 Peter 2, 18-25, Peter specifically addressed household servants who in the Roman Empire were almost always slaves and were often mistreated by their masters. He taught about the difference between suffering for one's faults and enduring undeserved punishment. Peter encouraged servants to learn from the example of Jesus Christ, who was falsely accused before Jewish and Roman leaders and yet did and yet did not retaliate. The Greek word Peter used that was translated as buffeted literally means to be struck with fists and is the term used by both Matthew and Mark to describe the treatment of the master. Peter hinted at the contemptuous scorn of the Jewish leaders and Christ's silence acceptance of it, which he bore with dignity. That's 1 Peter 2.23. Peter mentioned the stripes the Lord received using the word which means bruise or the bloody welt which resulted from lashing with a whip, which, exactly, which is exactly the result of a Roman scourging. While serving as a member of the Quorum of Seventy, Alexander, Elder Alexander B. Morrison taught, Peter, the great apostle, who himself suffered a martyr's death, recognized that divine merit is associated with patient suffering for Christ's sake, but that little glory occurs to us if we suffer for our own sins. As we endure undeserved suffering, we develop Christ-like attributes that, perf that perfect our souls and bring us closer to him. End of quote. Elder Nilai Maxwell adds the following insight to Christ's great example, quote, Because Jesus was brilliant beyond our comprehension, he knew even premortally, though intellectually, what he was volunteering to do. Yet he had to experience it all personally, especially the awful agony of Gethsemane and Calvary. He who is more intelligent than they all is also more meek than they all. He went meekly forward and partook of the most bitter cup and did so without becoming bitter. End of quote. Let's now go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Husbands and wives should honor each other. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, heirs together of the grace of life. In 1 Peter 
3, verses 1 through 6, Peter encouraged Christian wives to be in subjection to their non-believing husbands who obey not the word in order to win them over for Christ for their righteous conduct. See 1 Peter 3, 1, footnote C, and chapter 3, verse 2, footnote B. The use of the word subjection should not be understood as a passive or docile obedience. Rather, the word subjection and submissive are used in the scriptures to mean selflessness, humility, and love within relationships. The teachings of the Restoration make it clear that both the husband and wife should be humble, submissive, and selfless in their interactions with one another. No one is required to follow anyone in unrighteousness. In dress and outward appearance, the wife should be modest. In 1 Peter 3.3, 3, the pl plating or braiding of hair was used by lewd women of Peter's day. And wearing of gold and putting on apparel, the cloak or mantle was associated with harlots. This seems to be similar what, to what Nephi described in 1 Nephi 13, 7 through 8, which says, And I also saw gold and silver and silk and scarlet and fine twine linen and all manner of precious clothing, and I saw many harlots. And the angel spake to me, saying, Behold the gold and the silver and the silk and the scarlets and the fine twine, fine twine linen and the precious clothing and harlots are the desires of the great and of the honorable church. As Joseph Smith taught, faithful saints should, quote, cultivate a meek and quiet and peaceable spirit, unquote. From the hidden man of heart, even an ornament of meekness, of meek and quiet spirit. Peter taught that female saints who show devotion to God follow in the tradition of holy women, such as Sarah, the wife of Abraham. When Peter described women as the weaker vessel, he could sim have simply meant that in most cases women have less physical strength than men. Peter did not imply that women are any less worthy than men. In fact, he went on to say that women are heirs together with men of the grace of life, 1 Peter 3, 7. In the family of proclamation to the world, the Lord states, by divine design, Fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness and are responsible to protect, I'm sorry, responsible to provide the necessities of life and to protect and protection for their families. Mothers are primarily responsible for the nurture of their children. In these sacred responsibilities, fathers and mothers are obligated to help one another as equal partners. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, spoke of Heavenly Father's plan to exalt his sons and his daughters, quote, Surely we must agree that our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ know best which opportunities the sons and daughters of God need to best prepare the human family for eternal life. End of quote. Let's get over the silly argument about why only men hold the priesthood. And let's focus on using the priesthood, regardless of who holds it, to gain eternal life. On another occasion, Elder Ballard spoke of the equality of women and men in God's eyes, quote, In our Heavenly Father's great priesthood, endowed Blahan, men have the unique responsibility to administer the priesthood, but they are not the priesthood. Men and women have different but equal valued roles. Just as women cannot conceive a child without a man, so a man cannot fully exercise the power of the priesthood to establish an eternal family without a woman. In other words, in the eternal perspective, both the procreative power and the priesthood power are shared by husband and wife. End of quote. 1 Peter 3, 8-17 Christian virtues and godly conduct abound in the lives of the Lord's people. Compassion, love, courtesy, and the spirit of blessing are but the beginning of the attributes of deity which they possess. Were these heaven pattern, where, 
these heaven pattern virtues are, there are the true saints. Where these are not, true religion has not taken hold of the souls of men, however devout they may otherwise appear to be. 1 Peter 3.8 Be ye all of one mind. Perfect unity prevails among the saints. There are no divisions among them. They are all they all believe and think and speak alike because they, by the power of the Holy Ghost, have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 Be one, and if you are not one, you are not mine. Doctrine and Covenants 38.27 Our Father in Heaven is more interested in unity than he is in diversity. And in fact, it is unity of one heart and one mind that will bring us into his kingdom not being diversified. Chapter 3, verse 9, Render good for evil, and the Lord will bless you. Chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, Peter here quotes more accurately, perhaps paraphrases, the cry of David when the ancient psalmist, feeling troubled and per persecuted, sought salvation in the midst of perilous circumstances, and was assured that those who trust in the Lord shall triumph. The angel of the Lord encampeth about them that fear him and deliver them, David said. And then, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep the tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Speak peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are opened unto their cries. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Psalms 34, 7 and 12 through 16. How often it is that the problem of one generation are those of another, and that the solution of them is for the Lord's saints to trust in him and keep his commandments. 1 Peter 11, chapter 3, verse 11. God's motto, Eschew evil, pursue peace. This counsel came at a time when some might have been tempted to give up a Christian lifestyle out of frustration or to retaliate in the face of persecution. This verse is an important follow-up to 1 Peter 2, 23 Jesus did no sin, and when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Pursuit of peace is a doctrine also given to the Latter-day Saints at a time when they were being sorely persecuted. Doctrine and Covenants 98.16 The Lord counsels his disciples to meet persecution with righteousness and peace. 1 Peter 3 verses 13-14 through 14. Ordinarily the saints are not harmed for doing that which is good, but if they are, so be it, and blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. First Peter 14 through 15, chapter 3, 14 through 15. Speaking of worldly people and influence, Isaiah to the saints said to the saints in ancient Israel, Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and let him be for a sanctuary. Then he comes forth with his great messianic prophecy that Israel redeemed shall be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to many among whom he shall minister. By applying Isaiah's counsel to the saints of his day, Peter, among other things, is equating the Lord of hosts with the Lord Jesus. He is directing the Meridian Christians to sanctify in their hearts Christ as, as the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 15-16, be ready always to give an answer. The true saints are an informed people. They know the doctrines of salvation and rejoice in the privilege of pr presenting them to the fathers of their children. Bear your testimony and use boldness, but not overbearance, which may cause false accusers to be ashamed because they accused you falsely. Peter counseled his readers to be ready to always to give a reason of hope that is in you. 1 Peter 3.15 
The gospel of Jesus Christ gives believers a hope of receiving the promised blessings of righteousness. And Peter reminded his readers that by bearing their testimonies, they would help others learn about the source of hope. In the phrase, be ready always to give an answer, the word answer is translated from the word Greek apologia, which can also be translated as defense. This Greek word is the root for apologetics, a term used to describe the defense of religious beliefs. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that the saints have a responsibility to defend truth, quote, articulate ad advocacy is surely needed now to respond to some of the secular sophistry we see and hear in the world. Austin Furrer warned, Though argument does not create conviction, the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Peter said, Be always ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. End of quote. President Russell M. Nelson explained how best to share our religious beliefs with others. Each quote, each member can be an example of the believers. Your good works will be evident to others. The light of the Lord can beam from your eyes. With the radiance you had better prepared with that radiance you had better prepared for questions. Let your response be warm and joyful, and let your response be relevant to that individual. Remember, he or she is also a child of God, that the very God who dearly wants that person to qualify for eternal life and to return to him one day. You may be the very one to open the door to his or her salvation and understanding of the doctrine of Christ. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 17, If occasion requires, it is better for persecution to come upon you because of your good conduct than for you to suffer for your sins. First Peter three eighteen through twenty and four six Jesus Christ preached to the spirits in prison. Peter is here engaged in a persuasive presentation of the suffering endured by the saints at the hands of wicked men. He is counseling the members of the church to bear up under such unjust burdens, and he uses Christ and his suffering as the crowning illustration of enduring the sharp daggers of infamy for righteousness' sake. Then, almost incidentally, he adds that this suffering of the just one resulted in his death and subsequent ministry among the departed souls, who, hearing the gospel in the spirit prison, would then be judged on the same basis as in the case with men in the flesh. And what a glorious doctrine that is. There is scarcely another gospel teaching, save our Lord's very atonement itself, to compare with it. To think that in the mercy and wisdom of God, every living soul shall have a fair and just opportunity for salvation and exaltation, regardless of time and circumstances of his probation. The great principle and procedures whereby the saving truths of the gospel are offered today, accepted by, and made binding upon the dead, de departed dead, comprise the doctrine of salvation for the dead. Pursuant to this doctrine, the principle of salvation are taught in the spirit world, leaving the ordinances thereof to be performed in this life on a vi vicarious proxy basis. By accepting the gospel in the spirit world, and because the ordinance of salvation and exaltation are performed vicariously in this world, the worthy dead can become heirs of the fullness of the Father's kingdom. Salvation for the dead is the system whereunder those who would have accepted the gospel in this life, had they been permitted to hear it, will have the chance to accept it in the spirit world, and will then be entitled to all the blessings which pass them by in mortality. Talk about God being a just God. While the Gospels do not mention details about Jesus Christ's experience between the time of his crucifixion and his resurrection, 
Peter provided the insight that Jesus went and preached into the spirits in prison, some of whom were disobedient in the days of Noah, while the long-suffering of God waited. President Joseph F. Smith was pondering the meaning of 1 Peter 3, 18-20 and 4, 6 when he received a vision now recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 138. In this vision, he learned that following the Savior's death, the Lord ministered in the spirit world, preparing the way for the gospel to be preached to, be preached to the spirits of the wicked. President Joseph Fielding Smith, which is Joseph F. Smith's son, taught of the work that is taking place in the spirit world. Quote, In the justice of the Father, he is going to give every man the privilege of hearing the gospel. Not one soul shall be overlooked or forgotten. This being true, what about the countless thousands who have died and never heard of Christ, never had an opportunity of repentance and remission of their sins, never met an elder of the church holding the authority? The Lord has so arranged his plan of redemption that all who have died without this opportunity shall be given it in the spirit world. All those who did not have an opportunity here to receive it, who there repent and receive the gospel, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. The Savior inaugurated this work when he went and preached to the spirits held in prison, that they might be judged according to men and flesh, or in other words, according to the principles of the gospel, and then live according to God in the Spirit, through their repentance and acceptance of the mission of Jesus Christ, who died for them. End of quote. Regarding this work in the spirit world, President Lorenzo Snow shared this thought. Quote, when the gospel is preached to the spirits in prison, the success attending that preaching will be far greater than that attending the preaching of our elders in this life. I believe there will be very few indeed of those spirits who will not gladly receive the gospel when it is carried to them. The circumstances there will be a thousand times more favorable. End of quote. We do not have extra-biblical, we do have some ex, extra-biblical corroboration of the idea of the preaching to the dead. From early Christian writings, we learn of Hermas, whose brother was Bishop of Rome, who wrote in the early 2nd century after Christ that Jesus' apostles died and then preached also the name of the Son of God to those who had fallen asleep before them. So there is accounts of preaching to the dead that are found in other writings besides just the Bible. Chapter 3, verse 18, Christ suffered for sins. The most severe and intense suffering ever undergone by any person in all eternity was borne by the Son of God in Gethsemane when he took upon himself the sins of all men on conditions of repentance. Behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I. What suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit and would that I might not, that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. The phrase, the lust for the unjust, means the Lord, the righteous Lord, who was without sin, suffered for us men who are sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 The phrase, that he might bring us to God, meant it is only in and through the atonement of Christ that men are or can be brought to God. If there had been no atonement, all men would have remained everlastingly in the grave without temporal redemption. And all men, having been cast out of the presence of God and being in bondage of sin, would have become angels and to a devil without spiritual redemption. See Second Nephi 9, 6-9. Can you, I can't think of a more miserable existence than that. We thank our God greatly for the atonement of Jesus Christ and breaking the bonds of both physical and spiritual death. Oh, how great thou art. 
Chapter 3, verse 18, the phrase being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit, meaning the Holy Messiah laying down his life according to the flesh and taking it again by the power of the Spirit. That is, having inherited the power of mortality, which is the power to die from a mortal mother, he voluntarily laid down his life. And having inherited the power of immortality, which is the power to live from an immortal father, he was able to take up his body again in glorious immortality. Chapter 3, verse 19, he went and preached into the spirits in prison. In the realm of departed spirits, there are two divisions, paradise, where the spirits of the righteous go to await the day when they shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. And hell, where the spirits of the wicked go to be buffeted and tormented until the day when they shall come forth in the resurrection of the unjust. Our Lord did not go in person to the spirits in hell, which is the spirit prison as such. His ministers in the spirit world were among the righteous in paradise, but even these considered their disembodied state as one of bondage. Thus, the design, the, the designation of spirit prison may be said to have two meanings. Hell, which is the prison proper, and the whole spirit world in the sense that all who are therein are restricted and cannot gain a fullness of joy until after their resurrection. Chapter 3, verse 20. These particular spirits, the souls of those who lived in Noah's day, were taught the gospel during their poor during their mortal probation. You see that in Moses 8, 19-24. Their opportunity to believe and obey the truths of salvation came while they yet dwelt in mortality. Hence, even assuming they accept the truth in the spirit world, the highest inheritance available to them is the terrestrial kingdom. They are forever barred from that eternal life found only in the celestial kingdom of heaven. This limitation on the doctrine of salvation for the dead was revealed to Joseph Smith in the vision of the degrees of glory. Speaking of the terrestrial world, the Lord said, These are they who are the spirits of men kept in prison, whom the Son visited and preached gospel unto them, that they might be judged according to the men in flesh, who received not the testimony in the flesh, but afterwards received it. So those that had an opportunity here and rejected it can receive it again in the next life, but their highest kingdom will be the terrestrial. Thus, there is no such thing as a second chance to gain salvation by accepting the gospel in the spirit world after spurning, declining, or refusing to accept it in this life. It is true that there may be a second chance to hear and accept the gospel, but those who have thus procrastinated their acceptance of the saving truths will not gain salvation in the celestial kingdom of God. Salvation for the dead is the system by means of which those who die without a knowledge of the gospel, DNC 128.5, may gain such knowledge in the spirit world, and then, following thy vicarious performance of the necessary ordinances, become heirs of salvation, on the same basis as though the gospel truths had been obeyed in mortality. Salvation for the dead is limited expressly to those who do not have opportunity in this life to accept the gospel, but who would have taken the opportunity had it come came had it come to them. All who have died without a knowledge of the gospel, the Lord said to the prophet Joseph Smith, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God, and also that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom. For I, the Lord God, will judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their hearts. End of Joseph's quote. This is the only revealed principle by means of which the laws pertaining to the salvation for the dead can be made effective in the lives of any person. There is no promise in any revelation to those who have a fair and just opportunity in this life to accept the gospel and who do not do it 
will have another chance in the spirit world to gain salvation. On the contrary, there is the express stipulation that man cannot be saved without accepting the gospel in this life if they are given opportunity to accept it. Now is the time in the day of your salvation, Amulek said. For behold, for this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day of men to perform their labors. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, where there can be no labor performed. An application of this law is seen in the words of the resurrected Christ to the Nephites. Quote, Therefore come unto me and be ye saved, he said, and repeating with some variations the Sermon on the Mount he had previously given the Jews. For verily I say unto you, that except ye shall keep my commandments which I have commanded you at this time, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Thus salvation, and that's 3 Nephi 12.20. Thus salvation was forever denied those Nephites unless they gained it by virtue of their obedience during mortality. On the same basis, there is no such thing as salvation for the dead, for the Latter-day Saints who have been taught the truth of salvation and had a fair and just opportunity to live them. Chapter 3, verse 21. The temporal salvation that came to Noah's family because they had faith to build and use the ark is a symbol of the spiritual salvation available to all men who through faith are baptized and use the principle of the gospel in their lives. Baptism, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, that phrase meaning, baptism does not wash away the sins of men unless they have repented. It is not immersion in water alone that saves. It is baptism plus right, personal righteousness. If those who are baptized are just and true, section 76.53, that is, if they have complied with the laws of repentance, which qualifies them for the blessings of baptism, then the ordinance so performed will be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise and will remit their sins on earth and in heaven. Dr. Commons 132.7 the phrase by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, meaning baptism is effic efficacious because of the atonement and resurrection of Christ. Without this most transcendent of all things, none of the terms and conditions of the plan of salvation will have any efficacy, virtue, or force whatsoever. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Saints should speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. In speaking about Christ's suffering, Peter taught his readers that they should arm themselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer as well. Then Peter said, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. He was encouraging the saints to think and act the way the Savior did as they faced opposition. The Joseph Smith translation of 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2 emphasizes that our suffering should cause us to forsake our sinful lives. Quote, For ye who have suffered in the flesh should cease from sin, that you no longer the that you no longer the rest of your time in the flesh should live in the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's first Peter four, verse one, footnote B. Those who are faithful when persecuted for righteousness sake, thereby show they have overcome the lusts of men and are walking in the Spirit. 1 Peter 4, 3-5 Before we received the gospel, we walked in wickedness, and worldly people think it strange that we no longer consort with them in their evil doings, for which evils, however, they shall give an account of at the judgment bar. 1 Peter 4, 6 Christ speaks preached in the spirit world. The Savior's preaching to the spirits in prison in an example of God's fairness and justice. The doctrine of salvation for the dead makes it possible for all mankind to accept the gospel, even though they may never have heard it in mortality. 
The doctrine of the salvation of the dead is unique to the Latter-day Saints. Elder Bruce R. McConkie states, quote, Nothing shows forth more perfectly the complete justice, equity, and mercy of God's dealings with men than the doctrine of the salvation for the dead. Salvation is not limited to those who are born in a favored lineage. It is not reserved for people who chance to live in a day when there are prophets and apostles on earth who have authority from the Almighty to teach the doctrine and perform the ordinance of salvation. It is not for those only who learn of Christ and his love in this life. It is available for all men in all ages and in all places in the infinite wisdom of him who knoweth all things and who seeks the salvation of all his children. It was ordained in the councils of eternity before the foundations of this earth were laid that every living soul, either in mortality or in the spirit world, would have a fair, a just, and an equitable opportunity to believe and obey the laws which lead to eternal life. The Lord be praised. End of quote. And salvation for the dead is limited expressly for those who do not have opportunity in this life to accept the gospel, but who would have taken opportunity had it come to them. The Joseph Smith translation of 1 Peter 4.7 to you, the end of all things is at hand means in every dispensation to gain, to gain salvation, the saints must overcome the world and endure manfully whatever persecution is heaped upon them. And as each faithful saint approaches the day of his departure to the paradise of God, it is as though he were prepared for the Lord's second coming. It is as though the end of the world had come in his day. That's why Luke 12, 35 through 48, as marvelously explained and clarified by the prophet Joseph Smith in the inspired version, sets forth the concept that the Lord comes in effect in every watch of the night, so that his saints of all ages must watch and be ready. So what he's trying to say is, death is kind of like the second coming. The second coming of Christ comes here. Death is we go back to Christ. And so that's why we need to always watch for and be ready for the second coming because none of us know when we may die and then we will that we will then be presented to meet Christ in the spirit world. And it's just like people need to be ready to meet him when he comes to earth here. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, watch unto prayer. The Savior warned, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must watch and pray always, lest ye be tempted by the devil, and ye be led away captive by him. And as I have prayed among you, even so shall ye pray in my church among my people, who do repent and are baptized in my name. Behold, I am the light, I have set an example for you, and it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words unto his disciples, he turned again unto the multitude and said unto them, Behold, very, verily, I say unto you, you must watch and pray always, lest, lest, lest ye enter into temptation. For Satan desireth to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Therefore you must always pray unto the Father in my name. 3 Nephi 18, 15, verses 15 through 19. First Peter 4, 8. In the King James Version, Peter's words are translated as charity shall cover the multitude of sins. The Joseph Smith translation modifies this to read, quote, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity preventeth a multitude of sins. That's verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 8, foot, footnote A. Joseph Smith said, Charity, which is love, covereth a multitude of sins, and I have often covered up all the faults among you. But the, pettiest th the prettiest thing is to have no faults at all. We should cultivate a meek, quiet, and peaceful spirit. End of his quote. 1 Peter 9-10 through 10, in chapter 4. 
Anciently, a hospital was a place for the shelter or entertainment for travelers, strangers, and other guests, and hospitality was the treatment given such persons. Since all that we have comes as a gift from God and is a manifestation of his hospitality to us, it follows that we are to minister from our means to the needs of our fellow men. Hospitality to each other thus automatically becomes the mark of a true saint and shall ever remain so, although in our modern society it is sometimes considered to be a, a matter of showing forth the social graces than of providing food, clothing, and shelter to the needy traveler. In the true church, hospitality is one of the characteristics of the members and officers, as for instance a bishop. See 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 3. This hospitality should be done without grudging, echoing what Moroni said, quote, For behold, God has said, A man being evil cannot do that which is good. For if he offer a gift or a prayer unto God, except he should do it with real intent, it profiteth him nothing. For behold, it is not counted unto him for righteousness. For behold, if a man being evil giveth a gift, he doeth it grudgingly. Wherefore, it is counted unto him the same as if he had retained the gift. Wherefore, he is counted evil before God. Moroni 7, 6 through 8. Now, this doesn't mean that if you do something grudgingly, it does help the person. But what he's trying to say, it doesn't help you any. It doesn't help you to become like Christ and to develop his attributes. So it's as if you had never done it. The reason we do things in the church is to become like him. And we cannot become like him if we do them grudgingly. 1 Peter 4, 11, the Joseph Smith translation says, If any man speak, let him speak as an oracle of God. Speak by inspiration, not of yourself, but simply as a medium through whom the mind and will of the Lord is revealed. This is an absolute requisite of a true minister. They must preach by the power of the Spirit. Unless they do so, they cannot minister life and salvation to the children of men. Hence the divine counsel that the Lord's servants are to treasure up in their minds continually the words of life, to rely upon the Holy Spirit, and then, without taking thought beforehand, to speak forth what the Lord wants them to say at the very moment of their preaching. Dr. Covenants 84, verse 85. 1 Peter 4, 12-6, Fiery Trials. Peter encouraged his readers to think it not strange when they are faced with a fiery trial. Peter's advice is relevant to any persecution that Christians suffer in behalf of their beliefs and reminds his readers that they ought to rejoice that they are counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how our sufferings can bring us closer to God. Quote, suffering is universal. How we react to suffering is individual. Suffering can take us one of two ways. It can be a strengthening and purifying experience combined with faith, or it can be a destructive force in our lives if we do not have faith in the Lord's atoning sacrifice. The purpose of suffering, however, is to build and to strengthen us. End of quote. Elder Maxwell noted that the value of the trial of the noted the value of trials when he said, spiritual refinement is not only to make the gross more pure, but to re further refine the already fine. End of quote. Elder Bruce Law McConkie taught, mortality itself is a probationary state, a time of trial and testing of all men. With reference to this eternal plan to send all the pre-existent hosts to earth, the Lord said, We will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord God shall command them. But the greatest trials of life are reserved for the saints. They are the ones whom the world hates, and they must overcome the world if they are to gain the Lord's approval. They face all that the world faces in the way of normal difficulty, sickness, disease, calamities, famine, pain, sorrow, death. And in addition, their faith in Christ and his works is tested to see if they will serve the Lord in all hazards. I will prove you in all things, the Lord said to his saints, whether you will abide in my covenant, 
even unto death, that you may be found worthy. For if ye will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy. Dr. Clements 98, 14 through 15. Blessed are they which are persecuted for the righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.10 and end of Elder McConkie's quote. Are we not grateful for the ordeals Joseph went through, sold by his brothers into Egypt, falsely accused, unjustly imprisoned, and so forth, to save the Lord's covenant people anciently? Are we not grateful for the torture and the pain Jesus went through to atone for our sins? Are we not grateful for the confusion in young Joseph Smith's mind that led, despite intervening persecution, to the restoration of the church and the fullness of the gospel? Are we not grateful for the physical trials of Brigham Young and thousands of people who persevered in establishing the headquarters of the church in the Rocker Mountains? 1 Peter 4, 17, justice must begin at the house of God. When men are slain and destroyed for their sins, let it begin at my sanctuary, saith the Lord. Ezekiel 9, 6. For where there is more light, there is greater condemnation. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, a day of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation. And as a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house it shall go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. So that's what Peter was trying to explain to him when he says judgment must begin at the house of God. The judgments and the, the calamities that will come in the last days will begin with God's people first. 1 Peter 4, 18-19 If any man in God's church will be scarcely saved, just think of what God's judgments will do to the ungodly and the sinner. 1 Peter chapter 5, the elders are to feed the flock. 1 Peter 5, 1, who and also an elder. An, el, an, an apostle is an elder, Doctrine and Covenants 20, 38. And so is every person who holds the Melchizedek priesthood by classifying himself with his high apostolic calling as an elder. Peter dramatizes the preeminence of the priesthood over the office in the priesthood a principle which dignifies the status of all brethren who hold the holy priesthood and raises them, as it were, to apostolic stature. The priesthood is greater than any of its offices. No office has any power, dignity, or authority to the priesthood. An elder has all the priesthood he needs to qualify for exaltation in the highest heaven of the celestial world. Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were ordained elders on April 6, 1830, thus obtaining the first ordained offices in the church in this dispensation. Peter, James, and John had conferred the Melchizedek priesthood upon them in June of 1829, but there were no offices in the priesthood until after the organization of the church. It is not possible to hold an office in an organization that does not exist. Later, other officers... Offices came as they needed, as the needs of the ministry required. Ordinations to offices must conform to the law of common consent. Those receiving priesthood offices have the obligation to labor with zeal and energy in their particular callings. It is by magnifying one's calling in the higher priesthood that men obtain exaltation in the eternal world. Priesthood office exist in time and in eternity, and those who magnify their callings in this life will continue on as ministers of Christ, holding offices in the priesthood in the realms to come. Chapter 5, verse 1, A partaker of the glory that shall be revealed means Peter's calling election had been made sure. He had already received the promise of eternal life in the heavenly Father's kingdom. See 2 Peter 1, 1-19. 1 
Chapter 5, verse 2, feed the flock of God, meaning the elders, priests, and teachers of this church shall feed the teach the principles of my gospel, which are in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, in which is the fullness of the gospel, and they shall observe the covenants and church articles to do them, and these shall be their teachings, as they shall be directed by the Spirit. Doctrine and Covenants 42, 12-13 doing so willingly and not by constraint, unrighteous dominion, or compulsion, but by persuasion, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, and love unfeigned. Doctrine and Covenants 121, 36 to 37, and verse 41. Chapter 5, verse 3, not lording it over those entrusted to you, Peter was trying to say. Although Peter had full apostolic authority, he did not lord it over his readers in his letters, but exemplifies the virtues he recommends. Chapter 5, verse 4, the chief shepherd, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ himself, a crown of glory, meaning eternal life. Chapter 5, verse 5, the younger submit yourself to the other, meaning the divine plan calls for the younger and rising generation to take counsel from their elders, to submit to parental guidance, to conform to the revealed pattern. Rebellion, dissension, and disobedience are anti-Christ. 5, verses 5 through 6, humility. All progress in spiritual things is conditioned upon the prior attainment of humility. Pride, conceit, haughtiness, and vainglory are of the world and stand as a bar to the receipt of spiritual gifts. We are commanded to be humble. Always retain and remember it's the greatness of God in your own nothingness, Mosiah said, and his goodness and long suffering towards you, unworthy creatures. King Benjamin taught, and humble yourselves even the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily and standing steadfastly in the faith. Mosiah 4.11 Humility must accompany repentance to qualify a person for baptism. D.N.C. 20.37 It is required of all engaged in gospel service. D.N.C. 12.8 is an essential attribute of all who embark in the service of God, D&C 4.6. Proceeds the acquiring of wisdom from the Spirit, Doctrine and Covenants 136, 30 through 33, and is needed to qualify the righteous to see God, Doctrine and Covenants 67.10. And without it, no one can gain inheritance to the kingdom of God hereafter, 2 Nephi 9.42. Doctrine and Covenants 112.10 Be thou humble, and the Lord thy God shall lead thee by thy hand and give thee answers to thy prayers. 1 Peter 5.7 Casting all your cares upon him, meaning trust his part of humility. You have been taught to cast your burdens of anxiety upon God. Cast it all. I'm sorry. Trust is part of humility. I read that wrong. You have been taught to cast your burdens of anxiety of God. Cast it all. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, meaning calm, not under the influence of passion. Be vigilant, meaning Satan does not sleep or take vacation. He is continually and without dogged determination seeking whom he can devour. Doctor of Covenants 10, 5 says, pray always that you may come off conqueror, yea, that you may conquer Satan that you may escape the hands of the servants of Satan that do uphold his work. 1 Peter 5, 9, the real adversary you have to guard against is the great accuser, who with restless activity seeks to terrify you into your ruin. Resist him bravely in the trust, faithful that your brothers throughout this world are joined with you in accomplishing the one divine purpose of all these sufferings. 1 Peter 5.10, the trial, though sharp, is short, and through it God, whose gracious, gracious face is ever turned to you, and whose supremacy is eternal, shall bring you to perfection and security by calling us unto his eternal glory. 1 Peter 5.13, Babylon, in this reference, refers to Rome. By Sylvanus, I have written this letter to you. 
I recommend him to you as one whom I count worthy to be called a faithful brother. The letter is a short one, for indeed my affectionate exhortation and my testimony as an elder and apostle can all be put thus briefly. The true grace of God is manifested in the faithful conduct I have prescribed for you. Stand fast therein. The people of God who are in this city like the captives of Babylon, yet in the purpose of God, are one with you. Send greeting. So does Mark, my spiritual son. Let's now go to Second Peter chapters 1 through 3. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter may have written his second epistle shortly before his death in Rome. If so, his second epistle of Peter is one of the last testimony as an eyewitness of Jesus Christ's transfiguration. Peter exhorted his readers to, show, to grow in their knowledge of Jesus Christ and to seek to obtain divine attributes so they can partake of the divine nature. Peter assured his readers, both then and now, that this spiritual growth would lead to having their calling and election sure. 2 Peter 1.10 Modern readers will also be strengthened as they study Peter's description of latter-day scoffers who would doubt the reality of the second coming. President Harold B. Lee said, I consider the epistles of Peter among the finest writings we have in the New Testament. When I am wanting to pick up something that would give me some inspiring thoughts, I have gone back to one of the epistles of Peter. Peter stated that he was writing to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. This may indicate that Peter was writing to the same Gentile Christians who received his first epistle. The content of 2 Peter 1, 12-15 shows that Peter meant this letter to be a farewell message to his readers. Unlike the first epistle of Peter, which helped the saints deal with external persecution, Peter's second epistle addresses the internal apostasy that threatened the future of the church. False prophets and teachers were spreading damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Peter wrote the letter to encourage the saints to grow in their knowledge of the Lord and to make their calling and election sure. A dominant theme in 2 Peter is the importance of gaining knowledge of Jesus Christ. Peter promised his readers that if they would seek godly attributes and develop a divine nature, they would neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of their Lord Jesus Christ, and that they would have their calling and election sure. In chapter 2, Peter contrasts the true knowledge of Jesus Christ with the false knowledge and heresies perpetuated by apostates writing that one can escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At the close of this epistle, Peter gave a final admonition for the saints to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter knew the doctrines of his Lord and had a blunt, rugged, emphatic way of presenting them to his that is marvelous to behold. Nowhere else in ancient writ do we find the door so frankly open to a knowledge of the course men must pursue to have their calling election made sure. Nowhere else in biblical teachings is found such a plain, unvarnished recitation of the burning of the Lord's vineyard at his return to earth. And as for false teachers, how better can they be rebuked than to equate their course with the madness of Balaam, whose dumb ass spoke out to rebuke his iniquity? Second Peter chapter 1 Peter exhorts the saints to make their calling election sure. Second Peter chapter one verses one through nineteen. There are three grand secrets lying in this chapter, the prophet Joseph Smith said, which no man can dig out unless by the light of revelation and which unlock the whole chapter as the things which are written are only hints of things existed in the prophet's mind which are not written concerning eternal glory. I am going to take up this subject by virtue of the knowledge of God in me which I have received from heaven. And it is these teachings of Joseph Smith which we have essayed to put forth in the foregoing discussion. 
There are at least three secrets. First key, knowledge is the power of salvation. Second key, making your calling election sure. Third key, it is one thing to be on the mount and hear the excellent voice, etc. And another to hear the voice declare to you, you have a part and a lot in that kingdom. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Second Peter 1, 1 through 3, the knowledge of God. Throughout this second epistle, Peter emphasized the significance of having a knowledge of God. At the opening of this epistle, Peter taught that as God's followers receive increased knowledge of him, grace and peace will be multiplied in their lives, and all things that pertain unto life and godliness will be provided. Hence the importance of consistent and constant daily scripture study, gaining knowledge, especially spiritual knowledge. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught about the importance of coming to know God. Quote, it is one thing to know about God and another to know him. We know about him when we learn that he is a personal being whose image man is created. When we learn that the Son is in the express image of the Father's person. When we learn that both the Father and the Son possess certain specific, specified attributes and powers. But we know them in the sense of gaining eternal life when we enjoy and experience the same things they do. To know God is to think what God thinks, to feel what God feels, to have the power he possesses, to comprehend the truths he understands, and to do what he does. Those who know God become like him and have his kind of life, which is eternal life. End of quote. 2 Peter 1, 4 through 7, exceedingly great and precious promises. Peter said that God's exceedingly great and precious promises allow us to partake of the divine nature as we escape the corruption in this world. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught that exceedingly great and precious promises refer to promises of eternal life, which is the greatest of all the gifts of God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie also taught that to be partakers of the divine nature means to become as God is. Enjoy to the full every characteristic, perfection, and attribute which he possesses and which dwell in him independently. While serving as member of the 70, Elder Spencer J. Condy listed some of God's promises that helps us become more like our Heavenly Father. The Lord's, count, quote, the Lord's countless, exceedingly great and precious promises include forgiveness of our sins when we confess them and forsake them. Opening the windows of heaven is a promise claimed by those who pay a faithful tithe. And finding the great treasures of knowledge a cure, a, 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 a cure, a cure to those who observe the word of wisdom. Becoming unspotted from the world is a promise to those who keep the Sabbath day holy. Divine guidance and inspiration are promised to those who feast upon the words of Christ and who liken all scriptures unto themselves. The Lord also promised that whosoever ye shall, whatsoever ye shall ask him in my name, which is right, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be given you. We are promised that the Holy Ghost will be our constant companion when we let virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly. We can claim the spiritual liberating promise of fasting, which will loose the bands of wickedness, undo our heavenly burdens, and break every yoke. Those who are sealed in the holy temples and who are faithful keep their covenants will receive God's glory, which shall be a fullness and a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. End of quote. Speaking of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1 4, that we can obtain through God's promises, President Ezra Taft Benson explained, quote, The Apostle Peter spoke of the promises by which a person can be made a partaker of the divine nature. This is important, for if we truly become partakers of the divine nature, we become like the Savior. The virtues outlined by Peter are part of the divine nature or the Savior's character. These are the virtues we are to emulate if we would be more like him. End of quote. Furthermore, we attain these attributes. For, 
Let me try again. Furthermore, by attaining these attributes, we grow in our knowledge of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, quote, It is not wisdom that we should have all knowledge all at once before us, but we should have a little at a time when we can comprehend it. Add to your faith knowledge, etc. The principle of knowledge is the principle of salvation. This principle can be comprehended by the faithful and diligent, and everyone that does not obtain knowledge sufficient to be saved will be condemned. The principle of salvation is given us through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. End of quote. Joseph Smith also explained, quote, Contend earnestly for the like precious faith which the Apostle Peter and add to your virtue, if I'm sorry, add to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you unbound, they make you <clears throat> that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is for a man to be saved from all his enemies, for until a man can triumph over death, he is not saved. A knowledge of the priesthood alone will do this. End of Joseph Smith's quote. 2 Peter 1, 5-7 The attributes of godliness are list, here listed are the ones which qualifies the Lord's ministers for effective service on his errand and all his saints for eternal life in his kingdom. Salvation must be won, and to go where God is, we must be like him. And to be like him, we must possess the character, perfections, and attributes which he possesses. And faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, goodliness, charity, humility, diligence. That was Dr. Covenants 4, 5 through 6. 2 Peter 1, 8 through 12. These things, what is Peter referring to? Peter said that if the saints seek virtue, knowledge, patience, and the other virtues listed in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, they will gain the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The term these things in verses 8 through 10 and 12 refers to the attributes listed in verses 5 through 7. Peter explained that when these attributes abound in a person, they will not be barren nor unfruitful. They can see things that are afar off, and their calling and election can be made sure. Because the process of gaining knowledge and godlike attributes is so important, Peter declared, I will not be neg negligence to put you always in remembrance of these things. These things, meaning the attributes of godliness, are 1. Diligent, being consistent and constant. 2. Faith, doing what God wants, when he wants it done, and how he wants it done. 3. Virtue, meaning moral excellency and rectitude in every field, including personal chastity. For knowledge, an understanding of and familiarity with gospel truth, a clear perception of eternal truth, enlightenment and learning about God and his laws. Thus a man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge of God and his laws, and it is impossible for a man to be saved in ignorance of Jesus Christ and the saving principles of the gospel. 5. Temperance, meaning moderation, particularly habitual moderation, in regards to the indulgence of the natural appetites and passions. 6. Patience, the patience of the saints consists in bearing or enduring pains, trials, and persecutions, even unto death, without complaint and without equanimity, meaning firmness of mind, and with equanimity, meaning firmness of mind. Patience also involves an exercise of forbearance under provocation as illustrated in the celestial principle, whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Seven, godliness, meaning obedience to every word of God, for ye shall live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. Eight, brotherly kindness, meaning kindness embraces 
an interest in another's welfare and a disposition to be helpful, the kind or tender, gracious, benevolent, well-disposed, and exhibit sympathy and humaneness towards their fellow man. Nine, charity, meaning the pure love of Christ. Second Peter 1, verses 10 through 11, making your calling election sure. Peter exhorted the saints to make your calling election sure. He promised, those who do so shall never fall and will receive an inheritance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord. Teaching on this subject, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, to have one's calling and election made sure is to be sealed up into eternal life. It is to have the unconditional guarantee of exaltation in the highest heaven of the celestial world. It is to receive the assurance of Godhood. It is, in effect, to have the day of judgment advanced so that in an inheritance of all glory and honor of the Father's kingdom is assured prior to the day when the faithful actually enter into the divine presence to sit with Christ in his throne, even as he is set down with his father, with his father in his throne. For a full, thorough exposition on make your calling election sure and what is involved, I would encourage you to go to Brother McConkie's Doctrinal New Testament Commentary, Volume 3, pages 325 through 350, and he gives a thorough exposition on what it means and what to do to have your calling election made sure. The prophet Joseph Smith further explained, After a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on his hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and lay, living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted." When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter which the Lord had promised his saints as recorded in the testimony of St. John in the 14th chapter. End of quote. 2 Peter 1, 12-15, Remembrance of These Things. Peter, like Helaman, knew that as because mankind has fallen and are enticed by the natural man, that we need to be kept in remembrance of the gospel and the attributes that enable us to become like God. Thus Helaman said, Oh, how foolish and how vain and how evil and devilish and how quick to do iniquity and how slow to do good are the children of men. Yea, how quick to hearken unto the words of the evil one and to set their hearts upon the vain things of the world. Yea, how quick to be lifted up in pride. Yea, how quick to boast and do all manner of that which is iniquity and how slow they are to remember the Lord their God and to give ear unto his counsel. Yea, how slow to walk in wisdom's path. Helaman 12, 4 through 5. Second Peter 1, 16 through 18. Eyewitnesses of his majesty, Peter was meaning. Peter's witness of Jesus Christ was not based on myths or cunning devised fables, but rather on his first-hand experience with Jesus Christ, including his witness of the Savior's transfiguration. 2 Peter 1, 19-21, the more sure word of prophecy. Peter taught that he had received what he called a more sure word of prophecy, the prophet Joseph Smith defined what this term means, quote, The more sure word of prophecy means a man knows that he is sealed up into eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. On another occasion, the prophet Joseph Smith instructed further, quote, I would exhort you to go on and on to continue to call upon God until you make your calling election for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until you obtain it. The Joseph Smith translation of 2 Peter 1.19 states, We have therefore a more sure word 
a more sure knowledge of the word of prophecy, to which word of prophecy ye do well that ye take heed. See 2 Peter 1.19, footnote A. 2 Peter 1.20-21, source of scripture. The Joseph Smith translation of 2 Peter 1.20 clarifies that, quote, no prophecy of the scripture is given of any private will of man. That's uh, verse 20, footnote 8. Scripture is given by God to men through the Holy Ghost. Thus, true interpretation of Scripture must come through the Holy Ghost. Let's now go to 2 Peter chapter 2. False teachers among the saints are damned. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 22, false teachers. Peter pointed out that false teachers had plagued ancient Israel, and then he prophesied that false teachers would come into the fledgling church. These false prophets and teachers would bring damnable heresies among God's people, and many followers of Christ would be deceived. Peter described false teachers as wells of water and as clouds that are carried with a tempest. Further, he said that these false teachers would meet the same destruction that came upon the wicked in ancient times. 2 Peter 2.1 False Prophets As Joseph Smith said, a teacher who does not have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, is a false prophet. And as there were false prophets and teachers in ancient Israel, so there are among the Meridian saints, and so there are both in the world and in the church to the day. The phrase denying the Lord that brought them, Peter was saying, our Lord, pray, our Lord pays the price for the sins of all those who believe in him and obey his laws, thus saving them from spiritual death. According, those who belong to the church have been purchased with his own blood. They have been bought with a price, the life blood of the Lamb. And what more abominable heresy is there than for them to deny the atoning sacrifice of the Lord? Oh, brothers and sisters, we have been brought by the royal precious blood of Jesus Christ. how we ought to treasure that and live up to his pain and buying and purchasing our salvation. Second Peter 2, 2-3, two many of the early Christians were destined to be led away by false teachers, teachers who would be damned for their pernicious ways and teachings. 2 Peter 2, 4-9, if God cast one-third of the host of heaven down to eternal damnation for the rebellion, if in the flood he destroyed all of all but Noah and his family for rejecting the divine will, if he rained brimstone and fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah, utterly destroying all save Lot and his family only that dwelt therein for their sins and abominations, why should false prophets and teachers expect to escape the wrath of him who is no respecter of persons? The godly will be delivered out of temptation, and the unjust will be punished. Second Peter 2, 10 through 12, the phrase, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Peter condemned false prophets and false teachers who speak evil of leaders in God's church. President Spencer W. Kimball warned that the actions of church members who criticize church Members who criticize authorities of the church stem from the spirit of apostasy. Quote, they speak evil of dignities and of the things that they understand not, says Peter. They complain of the programs, belittle the, the constituted authorities, and generally set themselves up as judges. After a while, they absent absent themselves from the church meetings for Im imagined offenses and fail to pay their tithes and meet their church obligations. In a word, they have the spirit of apostasy, which is almost always the har harvest of the seed of criticism. As Peter puts it, they perish in their own corruption. In plain, blunt language, Peter sets forth what the Holy Ghost thinks of members who depart from the truth and walk in the ways of wickedness.
In the process, he tells why people apostatize, showing that in large measure it is a matter of succumbing to the lust of the flesh. That is, men choose to disbelieve the truth because it condemns their evil deeds, rather than bridle their passions as the gospel requires. They choose to live carnal and evil lives, with the result that they are worse off than if they had never received the truth in the first instance. Quoting DNC 3 4, for although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Elder Mille Maxwell gave the following insight of those who seek to deceive others. He stated, Church members will live in this wheat and terror situation until the millennium. Some real terrors even masquerade as wheat, including the few eager individuals who lecture the rest of us about church doctrines in which they no longer believe. They criticize the use of church resources to which they no longer contribute. They condescendingly seek to counsel the brethren whom they no longer sustain. Confronting, except of themselves, of course, they leave the church, but they cannot leave the church alone. Like the throng on the ramparts of the great and spacious building, they are intensely and busily preoccupied, pointing fingers of scorn at the steadfast iron rodders. Considering their ceaseless preoccupation, one wonders, is there no divisionary activity available to them, especially in such a large building like a bowling alley? Perhaps in their mockings and beneath the stir are repressed doubts of their doubts. In any case, given the perils of popularity, Brigham Young advised that this people must be kept where the finger of scorn can be pointed at them. Hopefully that people pointing the finger of scorn helps keep us in line and helps keep us within the counsels of the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 11. Judgment is the Lord's. He will rebuke and condemn all others, even including Mike, mighty Michael and the hosts of heaven's angels, are to bring no railing accusation against governments and leaders. It's also in Jude 9. Second Peter 2, 12. Natural brute beasts, meaning backsliding church members who are are as creatures without reason, and how often apostasy is born of emotion, not of reason. Chapter 2, verse 13, the reward of unrighteousness. Among church members, it is to lose the blessings of the gospel, which are peace in this life and eternal life in the world to come. The phrase to riot in the daytime means to engage in open public willful sin, to rebel against the truth without making any effort to hide one's opposition to the cause of righteousness. The phrase, pleasure to riot in the daytime, Peter spoke about people who, commit, who count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Excessive drinking and eating were generally looked down upon on Peter's day. Therefore, many chose to participate in such behavior at night in order to avoid the shame and embarrassment of being discovered. In contrast, Peter pointed out the false teachers and their followers were not ashamed to do their evil work in public for all to see. The phrase spots, they are and blemishes, means spiritually diseased members of the body of the church, their evil or, or which should be cut away with the surgeon's knife, lest the whole body be overcome with disease. The phrase sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, Peter was saying, proudly, proudly, displaying, them, proudly displaying themselves in the church and pretending to feast upon the good word of God, though they are in fact out of harmony with the teachings and practices of true saints. Chapter 12, verse 14, the eyes full of adultery, meaning the lust of the eyes. 
through which they commit adultery in their hearts. This is a superb example of figurative language. Eyes full of adultery is the personification of lust. Cursed children, Peter was talking about, members of the household of faith who reject Christ, their adopted father, and are thereby rejected by him. Contrasted with obedient children, those members of the church who, keeping the faith, honor the new name they have taken upon themselves. Chapter 2, verse 15, the wages of unrighteousness. This phrase meaning, in this case, as so often is, the wages of unrighteousness consists of the honors of men and the wealth of the world. Balak sent this message to Balaam. I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come thou, I pray thee, curse me this people. Balaam replied, If Balak would give me his full house of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less no more. After Balaam had prophesied well of Israel and ill of Moab, Balak in anger cried out, I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. The phrase, the madness of the prophet in this verse is referring to, could Peter have found stronger language? Surely it is madness, nothing less, to give up eternal blessings of the Lord for the passing honors and wealth of this life. 2 Nephi 15 through 16. This single inspired sentence enables us to put in proper perspective the whole story of Balaam, the son of Beor, who had in, who was entreated by Balak to curse Israel and bless Moab. That's in Numbers 22, 23, and 24. Though Balaam was true to his, to his prophetic trust and delivered the Lord's message of blessing to Israel and cursings to Moab, yet, as here shown, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. That is, he sought the honor and wealth offered him if he would curse the Lord's chosen people. And how often it is that the honors of men and the wealth of the world lead members of the church away from their duty and cause them to lose their souls. The whole story of Balaam and Balak is that Balaam was faithful and did not curse Israel. But then later he gave in and taught Balak how to get Israel cursed by getting to commit sexual immorality, which Balak did, the king of Moab. And so Balaam finally got his wealth and his honors, and he finally gave in to it. Chapter 2, verse 17, wells without water, meaning do delinquent church members from whom the waters of life should flow freely, but who instead have dried up spiritually, so their teachings can no longer quench the throats of those who thirst after righteousness. The phrase clouds that are carried with a tempest, meaning faithless church members whose duty it is to rain righteousness upon mankind, but who instead are themselves driven about the tempest of false doctrine. The phrase to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever means, having forsaken the effulgent gospel light, they are now overshadowed by the mist of spiritual darkness, in which state they shall remain forever unless they repent. In his dream of the tree of life, Lehi saw that there arose a mist of darkness, yea, even exceedingly great mist of darkness, insomuch that they who commenced in the path did lose their way, and they wandered off and were lost. Others, however, as he beheld, did press forward through the mist of darkness, clinging to the rod of iron, until they did come forth and partake of the fruit of the tree. And then, by way of interpretation, Nephi said, The mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil, which blindeth the eyes and hardeneth the hearts of the children of men, and leadeth them away into broad roads that perish and are lost. Chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. They teach false doctrine that have their roots in the lust of the flesh, doctrines which promise freedom from church restrictions, but which in fact bring those who accept them into the bondage of sin. In similar vein, many modern ministers teach openly and officially and with seemingly sincerity that illicit sexual relations are not always evil. 
that they are that there are situations in which adultery is not a breach of the divine law that homosexual perversion between consenting adults carry no divine condemnation that church members may choose to worship on a weekday so as to keep the sabbath free for hunting fishing or other recreational activities that there will be no second coming of the son of man at which the wicked shall be destroyed for he has already come in the hearts of those who believe and so on and so on through the 10,000 times 10,000 verges of current brands of false religions Chapter 2, verse 18, those that were clean escaped, meaning recent converts, newborn babes in Christ, those who have but recently come into the fold and who are not yet so secure and grounded in the faith as to be able to resist the sophistry of false teachers. Chapter 2, 20 through 21. For of him unto whom much is given, much is required. For he who sins against the greater light, so receives the greater condemnation. DNC 82.3 In other words, we are more accountable to God after we accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter is trying to say in these verses. Chapter 2, verse 22, Paul appears to be quoting Proverbs 26, 11, As a dog returned to its vomit, so a fool returned to his folly. Once we have committed to accept to live the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are responsible and accountable. It is actually better not to accept the gospel and make covenants than to do so, than to not live up to them. And now finally to Second Peter chapter 3, Latter-day scoffers deny the second coming. That our Lord shall come again to live and reign with men on earth a thousand years is amply attested in the revelations, both ancient and modern. In this second epistle, the chief apostle both assumes and announces the little nature of the second coming of the Son of Man with his, this added proclamation. In the last days in so-called Christendom, for the doctrine is not so much as an issue in other circles, the fact of our Lord's literal return shall be challenged. False ministers shall mock at such an antiquated view, and the scientists shall scoff at the idea of the burning of the earth as a prelude to the millennial era, when none but the righteous shall dwell on the new earth, thus cleansed from its wicked inhabitants. All history, all experience, and all reason, they shall say, negate these old-fashioned doctrines about the Lord living again among men. Surely the scriptures must mean that he shall come as a powerful or influence to dwell in the hearts of men whenever they gain oneness with him shall be their cry. But Peter, whose views came not from reason, but by revelation, replies, which is easier to believe in a creation, which in fact is self-evident or of second coming, to believe in the destruction of the world by water in Noah's day, of which fact there is ample evidence, or the burning of the vineyard in that day, as when it is in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Second Peter 3, 1 through 8, where is the promise of his coming? Some of Peter's readers may have been concerned by a perceived delay in the arrival of the second coming. Where is the promise of his coming? Verse 4, to illustrate the follow of becoming impatient while waiting for the second coming, Peter pointed out that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. In the Book of Mormon, Alma similarly pointed that all is as one day with God, and time only is measured unto men. Elder Neil A. Maxwell provided the insight that God lives in an eternal now, where the past, present, and future are constantly before him. His divine determinations are guaranteed since whatever he takes his heart to do, he will surely do it. He knows the end from the beginning. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. Second Peter 3, 1 through 2, both the ancient prophets and the apostles of 
Peter's day, as well as for that matter, all the preachers of righteousness of all ages and places have taught the same doctrine, a doctrine centered in Christ as the Son of God, a doctrine of his atoning sacrifice, of obedience to his laws, of his personal return to dwell among men on earth in the last days, a doctrine of salvation with him in the kingdom of his Father, which Peter want to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance of these things. Second Peter 3, 3, scoffers in the last days walking after their own lusts. Here Peter gives the almost in varying reason why men reject and scoff at the truth. It is their entanglements in the world, their failure to overcome the lust of the flesh. On the other hand, those who walk in righteousness have the companionship of the Spirit and thereby enabled to see and believe the truth. The Joseph Smith translation of 2 Peter 3.4, denying the Lord Jesus Christ, means if people, scientists, men, or supposed Christians, all people, do not believe that Jesus Christ is literally the Son of God, that God, a personal being, was his Father, that our Lord rose from the dead and now lives as he does his Father, having a tangible body of flesh and bones, why should they believe in his, little return, his literal return to walk again in the flesh with his brethren on the planet Earth? Joseph's mistranslation, 2 Peter 3, 4, says, All things must continue as they are, and have continued as they are from the beginning. In this simple statement, it summarized one of the basic reasons why the wisdom of men cannot interpret the events of creation, redemption, and salvation. The reason, it is false to assume that all things have always been the same. For instance, when the Lord created this earth, it was in a terrestrial state, in an Edenic state, a paradisiacal state. Death had not yet in entered the world. Adam and Eve and all things created were in an immortal state. The begetting of offspring had not yet begun. Then came the fall. And if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden. And all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. And they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin." But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam filled it might be, and men are, that they might have joy. In due course, when Christ reigns personally upon the earth, then the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. That is, it will return to its terrestrial, Edenic, paradisiacal state. It will be the new heaven and new earth of which Peter is about to speak. None of these eternal verities are known or to or understood by the scientists of the world or the uninspired teachers among men. Without them, how can they possibly understand the true import and meaning of the doctrine of the second coming of the Son of Man? 2 Peter 3, 5, the phrase that by the word of God, etc., that there were heavens from of old and an earth compacted out of water and through water by the word of God. A thing is made both out of and through its material. What the mockers forgot was that God who made can also break up what has made by his word. Second Peter 3, 6, the phrase, the world overfloweth with water, meaning there was a literal universal flood. Second Peter 3, 7, the heaven and the earth, which are now meaning this present planet surrounded by the atmospheric heavens in its fallen state, its telestial state, a state where carnality and evil can and do dwell upon. The phase reserved unto fire, meaning the vineyard of the earth shall be burned literally. The day cometh that they shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be as stubble. 
The phrase, day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, Peter was saying, the second coming when the unrighteous shall be destroyed by fire. For they that come shall be burned, saith the Lord of false, for it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Second Peter 3 8. Notice the different emphasis of the Joseph Smith translation of 2 Peter 3 8, which says, But concerning the coming of the Lord, beloved, I would not have you ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. When the Lord announced in the 19th century after Christ that his coming was imminent, near at hand, even at the doors, and so forth, it is true according to the Lord's time schedule. Time is measured by the revolutions of whatever planet or other heavenly body is involved. With reference to celestial time, the Lord said to Abraham that Kolob was after the manner of the Lord, according to its times and seasons in the revolutions thereof. That one revolution was a day unto the Lord, after this manner of reckoning, it being one thousand years, according to the time appointed unto whereupon thou standest. This is the reckoning of the Lord's time, according to the reckoning of Kolob, Abraham 3.4. Later, with reference to God's decree that in the day Adam partook of the forbidden fruit, he should surely die, the record says, Now I, Abraham, saw that it was after the Lord's time, which was after the time of Kolob, for as yet the gods had not appointed unto Adam his reckoning. Abraham 5.13 2 Peter 3, 9, God's seeming delay in bringing about the consummation of all that is a result not of indifference, but of patience in waiting for all who will come to repentance. This, the scoffers, are wrong on two points. One, they fail to recognize that all things have not continued without divine intervention since the creation. The flood was an intervention. And two, they misunderstand the reason for the apparent divine delay. God is a long-suffering God. Chapter 2, verse 3, verses 10 through 12. When the Lord comes and the earth is burned, so intense shall be the heat that the mountains shall meet, melt and flow down at his presence, and carnal and worldly things shall be destroyed. In a revelation to Joseph Smith, he said, Every corruptible thing, both of man and of beasts and of field and the fowls of the heavens or the fishes of the sea that dwell upon all the face of the earth shall be consumed, and also that of element shall melt with fervent heat. Doctrine and Covenants 101, 24 through 25. In verse 11, If every corruptible thing shall be consumed at our Lord's return, how important it is for us so to live that we can abide the day of his coming. What manner of person should we be, as the Lord said, even as I am? Second Peter 3.13, a new heaven and a new earth. This earth was created in a new or paradisiacal state. Then, incident to Adam's transgression, it fell to its present state. We, which is a telestial state. At the second coming of our Lord, it will be renewed, regenerated, refreshed, transfigured, become again a new and a paradisiacal earth. Its millennial status will be a return to its pristine state of beauty and glory, the state that existed before the fall. So we will go back to a terrestrial type of earth. This same designation also applies also to the celestial heaven and earth that will prevail in the day when the Father and the Son make this planet their inhabitation. So this earth will go from a telestial to a terrestrial for a thousand years. We'll live in that paradisiacal state. And then after that, then we'll get another new heaven and earth and it will become the celestial kingdom. It will become a celestial planet. 2 Peter 3, 14 through 15. If you want to be ready for the things you are looking for, a new heaven and a new earth and heaven, then you must be diligent in living the gospel and be without spot, meaning being sanctified, and blameless, meaning being justified, made innocent without guilt. 
The Lord is patient and long-suffering. Therefore, we should be patient and confident in God's patient working out of his purpose. 2 Peter 3.16, Paul is probably the most misinterpreted prophet of whom we have knowledge. And it is stated in that day of Peter, But be it known that all men interpret the scripture at their peril. As Alma said, Behold, the scriptures are before you. If you will rest them, it shall be to your own destruction. And as Peter in this very epistle has taught, there are no private interpretations. The Joseph Smith translation of 2 Peter 3.17 says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know before the things which are coming, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So the Joseph Smith translation tells us that the members know things that are that are coming before that are coming, they have the prophecies of the future and that they need to guard them and be careful and not be led astray from their steadfastness of the knowledge they have of prophetic things. Second Peter 3.18, like the Savior, we are to grow from grace to grace, meaning gain knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, line upon line and precept upon precept. For he will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and prove you herewith. And whosoever layeth down his life for my cause, for my name's sake, shall find it again, even life eternal. Therefore be not afraid of your enemies. For I have decreed in my heart, saith the Lord, that I will prove you in all things, whether you will abide in my covenant, even unto death, that you may be found worthy." Thank you for watching. I know that was quite lengthy, but Peter has some of the most glorious doctrines on how to become like the Savior and it prepares for the second coming. May we heed them. May we follow them. May we practice them. And may we be steadfast in doing so. Again, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.